final raindrop in the puddle there at the end. That's nice. Thank you, ladies. All right, we'll go to uh, the book of 1 Samuel this afternoon, 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13. Continuing our series through the life of David, we need to do some, uh, a couple flashbacks here in the narrative to help us understand a very important person in David's life, and the title of the message this afternoon is The Loyal Prince, and uh, it is the jo- uh, son of Saul, Jonathan, and I uh, want to ask a question as we begin here this morning, this uh, afternoon, would you rather fight a 700 pound, nine and a half foot tall giant, or would you rather scale a cliff and take on an entire garrison of Philistines, you and your armor bearer? How many say, give me the giant every day of the week? Giant, we got any giant takers here? Okay, some giant fighters. Anybody like cliffs all the way? Let's go cliffs. No takers, no ta- okay. Um, so, my, my conclusion here is that pound for pound, Jonathan was every bit the warrior that David was, but this, this question screams now in my mind, where was Jonathan for 40 days in the Valley of Elah? Anybody ever wondered that? Where was he? I mean, surely for 40 days, somebody told Jonathan, hey, you need to take a look at what's going on. What happened? I mean, we know where Saul was. Why was he, what was his problem? Well, he was, the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him, and uh, he was struggling with many different things and very afraid. But where was Jonathan? And uh, I want you to be thinking about that as we, as we go through our, our time here. What led to one of the greatest friendships in all of the Bible? I want us to ask that question too. What was it about Jonathan and David that knit them together so powerfully? Um, and what can we observe in our lives and profit from it uh, in our lives? So we're going to look at uh, 1 Samuel 13. We first meet Jonathan in 1 Samuel 13, and uh, we see that uh, Saul reigned one year, and when he reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash, and in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan, and that's the first mention of his name that we see in Scripture, in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. So he's first mentioned here, and we see two main points about Jonathan's life this afternoon. And the first one I want you to notice is found here in this narrative Uh, It's at the very end, but I'm going to give it to you uh, first thing here. And the people ended up rescuing Jonathan from his father's just rashness. Uh, Saul had made a rash oath and said, if anyone eats until I have vengeance on my enemies, then uh, cursed be he that does so. And Jonathan had had some honey while he was chasing the Philistines, didn't realize that Saul had made this oath. And the people rescue him, and they say of him, they say, shall, shall Jonathan die? As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. And that is what I want you to see, first of all, about Jonathan. Jonathan worked with God. And we're going to go through this, and we're going to answer those questions that I asked. Where was Jonathan, the 40 days in Elah? as Goliath spouts his defiance to Israel, and what was it that bound these two men together. But we need to first of all uh, watch what Jonathan uh, was capable of as a a young man um, and uh, see his bravery for the Lord. Jonathan worked with God. Jonathan suffered the consequences of Saul's disobedience. You see this in chapter 13, verse 6. When the men of Saul saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed... And the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. What had happened here was 
Jonathan and Saul had sort of gone and poked the bear uh, of the Philistines. And I've said this before, the Philistines were the nemesis of Israel all throughout the time of Judges and well throughout the time of Samuel. And they had poked the bear of the Philistines, really, and everyone is scared to death. Um, They were getting along with the Philistines, but when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, look at the distress they're in. They hide in caves, in thickets. Okay, we have thickets here in Iowa. We were, Frazier and I were in thickets yesterday. Uh, we were hunting deer. And uh, in thickets, in rocks, in holes. So find a big hole and crawl in it. Okay, Th- that's Israel's army, literally in holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. If you know anything about geography, I won't throw the map up there. But, uh, you know, if you think of the Mediterranean Sea, and that's like one of the distinguishing characteristics of Israel is the Mediterranean Sea swooping down on this side, and then the Jordan River. And on everything on the west side of the Jordan River, we think of the land of Israel. Well, the east side of Jordan was the land of Israel as well. That was the land of Gad and Gilead. Okay? And if you cross the Jordan River, it's hard for the Philistines to come and get you because they've got to cross the river first. And that's why these men did that. They crossed the river into Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So he's, he's here, and they're, they're scared to death. At the threat of this invasion, some people follow Saul trembling. Others are in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, pits. And some, we're told later on in this passage, actually go and they have joined the Philistine army. Um, We'll see that later on. Um, They actually join up with the Philistines, traitorous. Saul is anxious to maintain the unity of the people, and he disobeys instructions, and he offers the sacrifice without Samuel. Samuel had instructed him that you are to wait until I come, and we will offer the sacrifice, and we'll seek the Lord together. And it was a test to see if Saul would truly obey the Lord, and Saul failed the test. He did not obey the Lord. He offers the sacrifice without Samuel, and Samuel rebukes Saul. In verse 15 here of chapter 13, Samuel rose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah after he rebukes Saul, leaves. And Saul continues to do nothing while the Philistines cut him off from reinforcements. If you look at verse 16, Saul, Jonathan, his son, and the people present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped at Mid- in Michmash. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned onto the road to Oprah, to the land of Shual. Another company turned to the road to Beth Horon, and another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. So nobody has a sword or spear except Jonathan and Saul. And um, he is cut off from reinforcements here. He's really in a situation uh, that is terrifying. And because of Saul's lack of communication with the Lord, the Philistines had worn Israel down to this very weakened military state. In verse 15, we read this. um, At the end of that verse, we see how many men were with Saul at this point. Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. That was the army that was with Saul. And only Saul and Jonathan had metal weapons. Now, how does that look for for a fight? You ready to sign up with Saul and go into war? be scared to death, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you? But Jonathan refuses to sit and blame his father for Israel's coming defeat, because that's what it looks like is going to happen. They're about to be just annihilated. He refuses to sit still and blame his father for Israel's coming defeat. He plans this attack in chapter 14 that really depends upon a miracle. And he says to his armor bearer, The young man who bears his his shield, we talked about that uh, earlier, that when they were fighting, you would fight with your right hand, your left hand would hold your shield, your personal shield, and another guy would stand on your right and hold a shield so you could fight between two shields. And I believe that was the setup that Jonathan had. And his armor bearer is, is with him, and he says to him, to the young man, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. 
It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord for saving by many or by few. So his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then. Here, I am with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. So he comes with this plan that really depends upon a miracle. He's going to go over to the garrison of the uncircumcised. He calls them the uncircumcised. This is the same word that David would use of Goliath in a few chapters. They're, they're out of God's covenant. And the armies were basically on either side of a deep ravine with cliff-like sides separated by several miles. But they're within sight of each other. And this ravine is very steep. Um, I almost put a picture in here of it. Uh, but Micmash is the, the type. You can still scale the cliffs of Micmash today. It's like an attraction over in Israel. Um, the cliffs of Micmash. Very steep, uh, rugged terrain here. And Jonathan says, let's go over and we're going to discover ourselves to them. And let me just, I won't read. I'll just tell you what the plan was. He says, it may be the Lord will work for us. For it's no restraint that the Lord um, save by many or by few. The Lord would have to work for them. Two men against the Philistine gar garrison, which is among an army as the sand, which is on the seashore in multitude. We're told that in chapter 13, verse 5. We're told that the Philistines, as they encamped at Michmash, their host across this, this deep ravine is as the sands of the seashore for multitude. And Jonathan's idea is, hey, let's you and me go down the ravine, climb up the other side, and we'll take on the garrison of the Philistines. His armor bearer says, let's go. There's something about these men uh, that doesn't quite make sense just yet. Um, there is still some uncertainty in this language that Jonathan uses with his armor bearer. It may be that the Lord will save us, will work for us, but he's ready to exercise his faith in the Lord. It reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they're standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, and they say, our God is able to deliver us. But what do they say then? But even if he doesn't, even if we burn up in the furnace, we're still not going to serve your gods. We're still not going to bow before the image that you set up. And those words that Jonathan uses, it, it is nothing for the Lord to save by many or by few. What did he base that off of? I'd like you to turn to a couple passages here, two in Deuteronomy. Chapter 20, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. This is the sermon that Moses gave before he died to Israel. Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. He tells them, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Do not be afraid of them. Can you imagine if you were a, if you were a member of the nation of Israel in this time and you heard that and you're not, I mean, we're not, you wouldn't be thousands of years removed from this, you would be you know, of the tribe of, of uh, Dan or Judah or, or Levi or something. And you hear Moses say this, when you go out against an army that is more numerous than you, you're outnumbered, don't be afraid because God's going to fight for you. What would have been your, your thought as you heard that? That would, be, that would be an amazing promise. But that is literally Jonathan's promise. That's his promise. He's, he is a member of the nation of Israel. He's God's chosen people. And he is going out in battle against people that outnumber him. And he should not be afraid. And I think he banked on that promise. Go to 28.7. Deuteronomy 28.7. Another promise Moses makes to the people. Deuteronomy 28.7. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. 
And we're told in other passages that one of you will chase a thousand. Those were the kind of promises, I believe, that Jonathan was looking to as he made this statement to his armor bearer. Hey, let's go get them. Because it might be the Lord will work for us, but it's nothing for a God to save by many or by few. He's basing that on promises that he's received. Jonathan's armor bearer is ready to follow a man of faith. Jonathan's main strategy was to determine the intent of the Lord in the battle. He sort of placed this fleece before the Lord. um, And the idea was uh, he had no... Urim and Thummim to inquire of the Lord. That was a device they used to to determine what the Lord wanted them to do in a specific situation. He He gives up the element of surprise in favor of knowing that the Lord would help them. So back to 1 Samuel 14 now in verse 8 and 9. This is his strategy. 14, 8 and 9. 1 Samuel 14, 8 and 9. Very well, he says, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. If we... If they say thus to us, wait until we come down to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So you got the picture? We're going to climb, we're going to go, and they're going to see us, and they'll say, hey, wait till we get down there. We'll show you something. That'll be, we'll stay here and we'll fight them. But if they say to us, get up here, we'll show you something. He says, you mark it down. God's delivered them into our hand. That'll be a sign. And so that's the sign. But it gives up the element of surprise. If you're going to attack a whole garrison of Philistines, wouldn't you like surprise on your side? But Jonathan says, nope, we're going we're to let the Lord determine this because it's not about us. You can see that. It's not about us. And so they go up and they discover Uh, show themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And look what the Philistines say in verse 11. Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've hidden. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us. and We'll show you something. Can you imagine what went through Jonathan's heart at that moment? And he looks to his armor bearer and he says, Come up after me for the Lord. And the word there is Yahweh, Yahweh. The Lord, Jehovah, has delivered them into the hand of Israel. They're, they're toast. Let's go get them. And they climb up. He says, Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earthquake, so that it was a very great trembling. And long story short, the the Israelites uh, begin to see uh, what is going on here. And um, God delivers this host into Jonathan and his armor bearer's hand. Saul's men pursue the Philistines in verse 20. The previous Hebrew deserters, look at verse 21. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. So the Philistines really had it bad. I mean, they had people that were uniformed in Philistine clothes, now turning and whacking at Philistines. And uh, the whole thing just came apart at the seams, and uh, they started killing one another. Nobody knew what was going on. And the Lord saved Israel, it says in verse 23. Note this. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to beth Why did God save Israel? Because of Jonathan's faith. And Saul made this oath, unknown by Jonathan, that no one should eat until he had avenged himself on his enemies. Think of the, think of the awkwardness of that. Here's Saul's finally linking up with the the army of his country and he's eating honey and finally they discover he's eating honey and they say, you shouldn't do that, we're not supposed to eat honey. And, And instead of a hero's welcome, he's condemned to death here. And then... Uh, consulting the Lord for direction, Saul discerned that someone had broken his oath. And 
Saul seeks to carry out his oath. He's just, he's unhinged. And the people save Jonathan and they say, he has worked with God this day. Jonathan was the man that would dare to believe God enough to act. Jonathan had said, it may be that the Lord will work for us. God's response was to allow Jonathan to work with him. Because of Jonathan's faith, the Lord delivered an entire nation. That's David's friend. He's not David's friend yet, but that's the character of this man. And just make application to to us. When we believe God and obey Him, we're working with Him. It's really the Lord that does the work, but He puts our name down next to His. And uh, are you a person of faith that works with God no matter what the consequences? God is looking for a man to believe Him. D.L. Moody was impacted by the statement that was made by Dr. Henry Varley. D.L. Moody was one of the great evangelists back in the 1800s, lived through the Civil War, and many hundreds, thousands of people were saved under D.L. Moody's ministry. But what really began a lot of his effectiveness was this quote by Dr. Henry, uh, Mr. Henry Varley. He said, The world has yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by the man who is fully consecrated to him. D.L. Moody would thought to himself, he said a man. He didn't say a great man or a learned man or a smart man. And if you know D.L. Moody, he was none of those. He was, he was very backward. Um, his language, even in his sermons, if you can hear or read some of his sermons, how he spoke, he was very backward and uh, just a very simple man. But he said, I, I, uh, I'm a man and it lies within the man himself whether he will or will not make that entire and full consecration. I will try my utmost to be that man. And that's what D.L. Moody did. He said, I'm going to surrender myself, fully consecrate myself to him. Our teens are studying consecration this entire year. And there is power in saying to the Lord, whatever you want, that's what I want to do. And that's what Jonathan did. He said, let's go, to, let's go attack the Philistines. It needs to be done. We're about to get annihilated. Remain, it, it doesn't matter to the Lord to save by many or by few. That's the character of this man. And we see, secondly, Jonathan befriended David. At some point after this, Jonathan came to know who David was. Now, I'm going to burst the bubble for many of us that grew up in Sunday school looking at flannel graph. How many saw flannel graph in Sunday school? Okay, all right. And they have Jonathan and David, and what do they look like? Young men, okay, and they're hanging out together with their arms around each other or whatever, and they're, they're the same age, and we think of them as these two guys that were best friends, and they were best friends, but the problem is Jonathan was much, much older than David, probably could be David's father. And just the chronology, if you study it, uh, Jonathan is a leader in the army uh, when David is born, okay, so it's... Uh, it's a little bit off there, uh, what, we've, what we've grown up thinking. But Jonathan is different in age than David, and at some point he, he comes to realize who David was. David began as a musician for Saul and then became his armor bearer. In chapter 16, verse 21, we see that Saul loved David when David came and appeared before him, and he loved him and he became his armor bearer. Think of David as an armor bearer. And, uh, and Jonathan is one of the leaders in the army. He commands a thousand men at least at, at points. And he realizes this young shepherd boy has come to minister to his father. Jonathan led his own army, as I said, of a thousand men. And so he's, he's a man in his own right, and he's not really aware potentially of who David is. But that all changes at the battle of Goliath in the Elah Valley. Jonathan befriended David after the battle with Goliath. And we're back to that question. Where was Jonathan for those 40 days and 40 nights as Goliath spouts his defiance? I believe if you go to 1 Samuel 15, 28, I want to show you, I know we're turning around a lot here. 1 Samuel 15, 28 
And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. So he could, Jonathan could have known. This is, uh, this is earlier on in, in uh, Saul's kingship. Samuel says this to him. And Jonathan could have known about someone being anointed to replace Saul's failed reign. How could he have known that? Any thoughts on that? Saul is given to fits of depression. So much so that he's in a fit of depression. Later on we'll see he throws a spear at David. That's not rational behavior. Hopefully no one has had a spear thrown at them this week. Okay, If you do, please see someone. Um, Throwing a spear at someone. This is irrational behavior, right? If he can throw a spear at somebody, do you think he can throw words? Yes, definitely. Can he spout off something? Probably could. And at some point, potentially, this isn't in Scripture, but Jonathan could have learned, maybe Saul raved about this during one of his fits, that the Lord's torn the kingdom from me. He's given it to my neighbor who's better than me, Samuel says. Perhaps Jonathan had heard something about this. He could probably see his father's decline Politically and spiritually, the lack of decision, the lack of decisiveness, and perhaps it overwhelmed him. And this could account for his total absence, I believe, in the story of David and Goliath. There's a writer that I have greatly appreciated on the life of David. His name is F.B. Meyer. You've probably read some of his books And he writes about this, Saul's failure in the matter of the destruction of the Amalekites. That's where Samuel told him, the Lord has torn the kingdom from you and given it to your neighbor. The dark spirit which possessed and terrified him, the alienation of Samuel, these things acted as a moral moral paralysis on that brave and eager heart. He's speaking of Jonathan's heart. They acted as a moral paralysis on that brave and eager heart. What could he do to reverse the decisions of that fated soul, his father? How stem the torrent? How turn the enemy from the gate? Surely it was this hopelessness of being able to alter any of these things that made him unable to meet Goliath. Many a time as he heard the terrible roar of the giant's challenge, he must have felt the uprisings of a noble impulse to meet him, slay him, or die. But there came over his soul the blight of despair. What could he do when the destiny of the land he loved seemed already settled? And here comes David, Saul's armor bearer, who's been in the court dozens of times, who now reveals the same daring faith as the prince. And I believe as Jonathan, if, if you allow for that possibility to be true, he's discouraged. He can't change anything. feels like this is just the way it's going to be. And, and I'm not saying he's right. I'm, he, should have, he should have gone out and fought Goliath. But does he do it? No, he's, he's discouraged. But here comes Saul's armor bearer, who's been in the court dozens of times, who God has said, somebody's going to replace Saul. He's better than you, he says. I think the lights must have come on in Jonathan's mind. This is the man. This is the young man. And it says, I don't want you to to miss this. Go to, to 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18. Saul has just inquired, whose son is this? Now, there are some that say, well, that couldn't have happened that way because Saul should have known whose son he was. Keep in mind that Saul's still throwing spears at walls and spouting off. And Saul is very irrational at this point. And I believe he's probably struggled with some mental capabilities here. And, uh, And it also could be that David, we know that David had been away from the court for 40 days. And so he was not as maybe a regular at the court, and Saul could have forgotten uh, whose, whose family he was from very easily here. But he's inquiring in the previous chapter, um, verse 56, inquire whose son this young man is. And he inquires, verse 58, Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Verse 1 of chapter 18. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, 
The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. When did that occur? It was right after this battle. Right after this battle. It says that his soul was knit, and the idea here, Jonathan's soul was chained to David's. That's the idea. Producing this deep love and lasting covenant. Deep love and lasting covenant. What was it that bound the soul of Jonathan to that of David? What do you think bound their hearts together? Any thoughts? Here was a young man who had repeatedly believed God. He had, he had repeated Jonathan's exploit from, year, from uh, months before. Here's another man that was with Jonathan according to all that was in his heart. Compare their words. Here's Jonathan about to climb the cliffs and face the garrison of the Philistines. He says, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Here's David before Goliath. He says, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. For then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Jonathan's sitting there and he's he's thinking, I said that one time. I said that. There's nothing that restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. The Lord does not save with sword and spear. I said that one time. Come, armor bearer. The Lord's delivered them into the hand of Israel. David says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. He will give you into our hands. Jonathan thinks, I said that. I believe that. I believe that's what drew them together is the courage that they both showed the relationship that they had with the God of Israel. This was a love of the deepest kind. When David mourns Jonathan later on, he says something in 2 Samuel 1.27 that sort of takes us aback. He says, your love to me was wonderful, meaning it's, it's, I can't understand it. It, surpass, it surpasses the love of women. People have latched onto that and said, really dumb things um, that misapply that verse. What David meant here is that Jonathan gave up more in his love for David than a typical woman would give up in marrying her husband. I'm talking a typical, uh, most women are not required to die um, necessarily or give up uh, what Jonathan gave up uh, when marrying a husband uh, in this day. Okay. Uh, to get married was to gain something. Jonathan, when he befriended David, gave up something. Uh, that's what I believe David was saying. There are no sexual overtones uh, to his love. Uh, both of them were married. Uh, both of them had children. David struggled later on with adultery. Um, this is a deep covenantal love. It is not what the world and some, sadly some Christians would make it out to be. There's nothing here of a homosexual type of relationship at all. So, and I hate to even have to address that, but unfortunately some people uh, take it upon themselves to twist the Word of God, and we need to deal with that as well. Um, we're not told of the details of this covenant, but look in verse, um, verse 3. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. We're not told the details of that covenant, but it seems that here's Jonathan, and Jonathan is the oldest son of Saul, and he would be the heir apparent to the throne. But it seems that Jonathan was assuring David that in in spite of David's popularity among the people at that moment, there was not and never would be rivalry between the two of them. He wanted David to know that. He would be more clear in a later covenant in, in 1 Samuel 20, uh, 12 to 17, he comes out explicitly and says, I know you're going to be king and, and all of these things. Um, 
And at some point here, he, he realizes that, and I believe it's here. And that really goes into our next uh, statement, final statement here I want to make about this. Jonathan's kindness suggests that he realized and accepted David's future reign. He's kind to David, and he, he realizes that David is going to reign someday. I believe he shows that by his actions here. Um, Jonathan, as I, as I said earlier, knew David would succeed his father. The question is when he knew this. All right, can you, you can think of passages in Scripture. Um, I'll show you some of them in a minute here. Jonathan knows that, that David's going to succeed his father. When did he realize that? The question is not if he knew it, but when did he know it? I believe that he knew it quite early and perhaps as early as at the Elah Valley. I know it's afternoon and it's getting warm in here probably, but I want you to, I want you to think of this. I want you to try to put this all together in your mind, okay? Can you go to the Elah Valley with me for a moment? We're going to the Elah Valley, okay? David is not cowering before this roaring giant. He roars back at the giant, okay? And he kills Goliath, knocks him down uh, with, a, with, a, with a sling and executes him for defiance against, against God. Jonathan here is standing on the sidelines, okay, in the Israelites' sidelines, and he's looking at what David says to the giant, and he's thinking, I said that one time. I said that one time. I believed that one time. And I think at that moment, I think at that moment, all of these things start coming together, and Jonathan realizes this is the man who God chose to replace my father. I've been discouraged. I've seen my father tank spiritually, politically, morally, all of these things. And you think of the awkward position Jonathan was in. What does Jonathan do? Does he say, Am I, pff, he's not going to be king. I'm not going to be king either. You know, it's, what do you say? I mean, that's pretty awkward. Um, but he realizes at this point, this is the man. I don't have a Bible verse for this, but if you put all these things together, I think the conclusion is, I think at this point Jonathan realizes, this is the man that's going to replace my father. I love that guy. I love that guy, not in a romantic way. I love that guy because he's a man of courage. And it gives me hope for this nation. It gives me hope for my country. And he goes and he makes a covenant with David, and he basically says, I believe to David, You've got no competition from me. I'm with you because you believe the same God I do. And so Jonathan comes, I believe, to that conclusion in the Elah Valley. Let me just try to prove that a little more to you. When assuring David that he would soon be king, this is in the wilderness of Ziph, okay, later on, down the road several months, maybe years, Jonathan and Saul is chasing after David. Okay, we're fast forwarding a little bit in his life. Jonathan or Saul is chasing after David. David hides in the wilderness of Ziph. Jonathan goes right into the woods of Ziph, and he finds David. It's just sort of the way it worked, and uh, he knows where David is. And he says to David um, that you, that you are going to be king. And he says these words: Even my father Saul knows that. Now, if I say to you, even so-and-so knows this, what am I saying about so-and-so? If, if one of you kids comes up and says, you know, blah, 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 even so-and-so knows this, what are you saying about so-and-so? Are they like with it, right, right on the money there? No, they're like the last person to find out. Even so-and-so knows this, okay? And so Jonathan says, even my father, Saul, knows that, which indicates that Jonathan and others had known it for some time. So when did he know it? I think he knew it when David killed Goliath. You also have in 1 Samuel 20, 31, Saul makes this statement to Jonathan. He says, As long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. Jonathan knew that Saul wanted him to succeed him. But as long as David lives on the earth, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. He knew that there was this competition, this, this seeming rivalry. But Jonathan had put an end to it. There was no rivalry whatsoever. 
The text is explicit about the gravity of what Jonathan did back in chapter 18. What does he do? I mean, some of you children, tell me what he does when he makes a covenant. Verse 4, what's he do first of all? Verse 4, chapter 18. He takes off his robe, okay? Outer robe, okay? Takes it off. What does he do? Gives it to David. Now, I, I think through this. If, if one of us takes off our jacket at the end of... I can't do this because I've got a microphone here. But if, if somebody takes off their jacket and they give it to you at the end of the service, you why did you do that? Then? But that's a very personal thing, okay? To take off a jacket and give it to someone. He doesn't go over and get one from the closet that he's had been saving for this. He bought it, you know, over at the at the department store. He gets his own robe that he's wearing and he takes it off and he gives it to David. What else does he give to David? With his sword, but before sword it says with his armor. He gives his armor to David. Second person that day that given David some armor. This one probably fit a little better. Um, he gave his armor to David. It says, and notice the words here, he gives his armor even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Even to his sword. Even to. What does that mean? He gave all of it. All the way down to his sword and his bow and his belt. If I give you my bow today, that's very significant because my bow is my bow, okay? Um, and uh, it was probably that way then. It wasn't a compound bow, I'm sure. But um, even down to his sword and his bow and his belt, to receive a belt from someone was, ex was an extreme honor. Again, fast forward many, many years, okay? And Joab, David's commander, is chasing Absalom through the woods. You remember this? Absalom has long hair and it's bounding up and down. And he gets stuck in what kind of tree, Fraser? Terebinth tree. Fraser, I was reading about what Fraser learned the other day and he said Absalom got caught in a terebinth tree. He's like, okay, I forgot about the terebinth tree. And uh, he gets caught in this terebinth tree and he's, his, uh, his, his hair is stuck there and Joab finds out about it. Some guy comes and tells Joab, There's, he's stuck up in, this, up in this tree, okay? And Joab says, why is he still there? Why didn't you what? Kill him. Because if you did, I would have given you money and a belt, a warrior's belt. And he says, I would have given you a warrior's belt if you'd have killed him. That was a great honor to receive in this day. Jonathan gives David not only a warrior's belt, he gives him his bow, he gives him the sword attached to his belt and the robe that he has on. And to wear a dignitary's garments was a great, great honor. Mordecai in the king's robes in Esther chapter 6, verse 8. Remember Haman says, if you really want to honor somebody, you should put your robes on them, put the king's robes on them, put them on the king's horse and say, this is what happens to the person who the king delights in. King says, great, Haman, that's a great idea. Go do it to Mordecai. Don't forget anything that you just said. And uh, Haman does that. And Mordecai is honored by wearing the king's own garments. And Jonathan gives David these signs of this covenant. What is, what is stated in the covenant? It's not stated here, but I think it's quite obvious. If you put all of this together, Jonathan looks at this man and he says, there's a man who believes like I do and trusts God like I do. I said that once. I want to say it again. Moreover, I want to be, I want to be the friend of a man like that. And this is the degree that I'm going to be his friend. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give him any trouble because I believe he's God's man who's going to sit on the throne of Israel next. And Jonathan makes a covenant with him and he gives him all of these things. Now that's a great story, isn't it? What does it mean for us? Number one, birds of a feather, what? Flock together. Birds of a feather flock together. You can tell a lot about a person 
by the people that they are drawn to. I went to a Christian school uh, growing up, and you can see this in any type of school setting, that there were different sort of crowds of kids. Nothing wrong about anyone in particular, um, but the more you got to know them, you saw that these kids were interested in some of the same things. Some of these were really interested in the athletics, and some were interested in uh, music, and some were interested in all, all kinds of different things. And um, unfortunately, there were groups that were known as being very not spiritual, not spiritually minded at all, and they all sort of hung out together. And they told some of the same jokes, they laughed at the same things, watched the same movies, did all the same stuff. There were others, thankfully, that were known as, if you, if you want to do right, you should hang out with these kids. And you can tell a lot of, by, about a person by the people that they're drawn to. You can also tell a lot about a person by the people that are drawn to them. What kind of people do they attract? So I want to ask you this afternoon, what kind of people do you attract? Adults, what kind of people tend to come and talk to you and hang out with you and be drawn to you? Are they people that are godly, that have courage, that walk with the Lord? Are they people that cut corners? Are they people that cheat occasionally? Are they people that know that you'll sort of look the other way and sort of go along with something? What kind of people do you attract? College age, what kind of people do you attract? You attract people that, that watch all the stuff that the world puts out, talk about it with you, feel the freedom to talk about it with you. Hey, did you see this? Not yet, but, you know, and they know that you're eventually going to watch it. Teens, what kind of people do you attract? People that want to do right? People that want to serve the Lord? People that are, they're not up on all the latest stuff that the world's into, but they, they love the Lord. Or do you attract people that, again, are maybe disrespectful to their parents, talk about their parents with you? Children, what kind of people hang out with you? What kind of people are drawn to you? People that want to, want to do what's right, want to play fair, want to stick up for somebody that's maybe not being treated fairly? Do those people hang out with you? Or do the, per the people that are drawn to you, are they the people that, again, are disrespectful, maybe they're not truthful, maybe they cheat. What kind of people do you attract? What binds you, secondly, to your friends? What makes you friendly with people? Generally, um, friends have similar interests. Um, they have different life circumstances that are the same, and so they, they talk about different things, and um, they're, they're drawn to one another in that way. Do you have godly friends? Do you have friends that what binds you to them in part is their godly courage, their character, their faithfulness to the Lord? You think, I need to hang out with somebody like that. I just like, I like, I like talking to the guy because every time I talk to him, I feel like I'm talking with the Lord or something. There are people that I know that every time I talk to them, I just, and it, I wish I could say this of, of every single person, but there are people that really stand out in my mind that every time I talk to them, I just feel like I'm with the Lord. I'm, with, I'm in His presence. And uh, that's a special thing uh, that, that you can be drawn to somebody. Uh, their godly courage, perhaps, or their godly um, witness, or just they, they draw you to, to the Lord. What binds you to your friends? So birds of a feather flock together. Something that we need to remember here. Jonathan was bound to David, I believe, because of David's courage. Because of David's faith in, in the Lord. And I would say also, true friendship is sacrificial at times. True friendship is sacrificial at times. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Friendship is sacrificial. If you truly are someone's friend, you will be willing to sacrifice for them. So again, just applying this, what sacrifices have you recently made for a friend, for a family member? Have you sacrificed? 
What have you recently give up, given up because you knew that it would be meaningful to help your friend, to help your family member? Think of all Jonathan gave up for David. What did, what did he really give up? He gave up the kingship. He gave up. He, he was not going to be king. He could have stood there and fought that. He could have put up some fight to this, but he didn't. He said, nope, you're going to be king. He gave it up for David. What are you willing to give up for a friend? That is, that we, when we think of friendship, when you think of friendship in Scripture, you cannot name too many names before you come to the names Jonathan and David. That is something that God has set in His Word as a godly friendship, and it's sacrificial. Sacrifice all over it. True friendship is sacrificial at times. And then thirdly, true friendship comes from a deep friendship with the Lord Himself. If you really want to be a good friend, you need to be God's friend first. Because none of us are patient enough and sacrificial enough and loving enough to be a good friend. We're all selfish, right? We all struggle with it. Anybody else selfish in here? I, I am so selfish sometimes and I struggle with that. I need to be friends with the Lord and have Him meet my needs so that I can meet others' needs. If we want to live as Jonathan and David lived, we need to know Jonathan and David's God. That is so important. Let's pray. Lord, would you help us don't know specifically what you are doing in each heart. Only you know that. I pray, Lord, that if there are some friendships here that we have in our lives that are not pleasing to you, that you would give us direction and give us wisdom to adjust those friendships. Maybe they need to end. Maybe they need to change. If there are friendships that we can think of in our lives that need to form because we desperately need the encouragement that that other person can bring and we desperately need to give the encouragement that we can give. We need to be united about, around your truth. Lord, would you reveal that to us? Most of all, Lord, we pray that our relationship, our friendship with you would be so meaningful that we befriend others and meet their needs as you meet ours. Thank you for this account of Jonathan's sacrifice for David, for his being drawn to David's courage and his faithfulness to you. We pray that you would make us like these men. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go to 581 in our hymnals here as we close today. 581, many now are watching the footsteps that we take. Many soon will follow in the choices that we make. Let us then be faithful to be what we should be and leave a good example that they can clearly see. Be an example of the believers in word and conduct. Be steadfast in love, in faith, in purity of life. For those behind us, let us stand within the gap and make a difference in their lives. Be an example to follow Christ. Let's stand as we sing 581. Many now are watching the footsteps that we take. Many soon will follow in the choices that we make. So let us then be faithful to be what we should be and leave a good example that they can clearly see. Be an example of the believers, word and in conduct, be steadfast in love, in faith, in purity of life, for those behind us, 
let us stand within the gap and make a difference in their